and good morning officially welcome to the live Q&A on child maintenance and child custody streaming live on Facebook live that is a platform from where I can engage with you if you have any questions I see the questions are coming in please head over to the advocate Mohammed Abdullah Facebook page you might be watching this webinar on the Our Lawyer Facebook page or on my personal Facebook page or on one of our groups However, if you pose a question there on, I will not be able to see it. I can only see the Advocate Muhammad Abdul Facebook page and you can see it's filling up now. Otherwise, if you are just interested in watching, please continue watching on the relevant page you are watching or looking at. Let us now deal with the first question. I'll need to copy and paste it quickly. So this will be question one. But I think the participant has a few more additional comments. Let me copy that in as well. Okay, there we have it. If my ex travels overseas for work and misses his hearing, can they locate him overseas? I will I'm I have a feeling he will leave before. The challenge with that is South Africa only has authority to deal with peoples within our own country. They will not instruct other international departments, other countries and advise them to use their resources to find someone for an inquiry. I do not know what type of inquiry you are referring to, what type of hearing you are referring to. Is it a child maintenance, a domestic violence, a divorce and so on. However, if the person was correctly subpoenaed to appear in court, want to appear in court if you appeared in court the first time and the magistrate told him please appear in court um, in a month's time or he received a court official court document stipulating he must appear in court on a certain date and he's in violation of that court order obviously the court will issue one of arrest and once he or she does appear back in the country they will have to author have to process that specific one of arrest and have that specific person arrested and bring, brought to the court because he is in violation of a court order. I see there's an additional comment. Owes maintenance. Let me just copy that up so we can all see it, especially for those persons who are watching this video a bit later. If you have any questions, please feel free. To free sorry, fee, please feel free to pose it. I'll be happy to answer it. Okay, so we did it with a child maintenance matter. The person, I presume, has been. Um, properly warned to appear in court, either receives a subpoena or a warning to appear in court by the magistrate. The long and the short of the matter is, my, based upon my knowledge, we will not go look for someone overseas. Once a person comes back into the country and there's a warrant of arrest out for that person, they will process it, they will execute it. But I think the resources, I mean, people are living locally and people do not appear in court. I doubt the government will spend money I think the government does not spend that much money and resources finding someone locally. Why would they spend a lot of money employing third parties overseas to find someone? And now they find a specific person overseas. Will they bring him back into South Africa? Will they do an extradition and so on? I, I doubt that will happen for child maintenance, um, for the government to apply all that specific resources applicable. It is theoretically possible, but I doubt it. Um, I'm sure that the court, what the court will do is once he appears back in South Africa, they will process the Pacific um, warrants and so on. I hope that answers that specific question and the commenter says thank you, you are welcome. Um, you are welcome to pose any other questions you wish to pose. I think there is one or two additional comments. No, there is not. International family law is a difficult field of law to practice because we are dealing with different jurisdictions, different laws. The challenge would be is how can South Africa tell a different authority, a different government how to what to do or what not to do. Each country is autonomous. They have their own authority and they can decide what to do. There are agreements between South Africa and other countries, for example, the Remo Act, the Reciprocal, Reciprocal Enforcement of Maintenance Orders Act, 
whereby a party in South Africa can apply for child maintenance in the local maintenance court and then the court will deal with the matter and make a provisional order and that specific order will be sent to the other country wherever the person resides and the country is obviously a, a signatory to the specific agreement and that specific country will do their own inquiry they will call the other party in whatever processes they follow in terms of their laws call that party in do an inquiry and say in south africa the mother applied for child maintenance the child is a the child is so so that that's the age of the child the mother earns so much money the the mother the child costs so much money the mother's expenses is so much etc this is a record of the inquiry that put, took place in south africa and south africa concluded that the mother requires a sum of let us say for the for sake of convenience a thousand rand that is what south africa concluded we're now in the in the in the, in the other country for example the united kingdom and that inquiry should take place they will do an inquiry into let's say for this specific example the father they will look at his income his expenditure um how much he can afford what is reasonable under the circumstances whatever the laws apply to that specific country each country will have their own principles their own policies etc we cannot answer for them and they will might say okay sir we we looked at the evidence in south africa we've looked at your evidence we feel now in the united kingdom that you should pay so much maintenance i'm being using a fictitious example united kingdom might apply a total different um, process but they'll make an order and that order will obviously be sent back to south africa due through diplomatic channels one diplomatic channel could be the office of the family advocate or the minister director general and so on depending upon the government department and that will happen and then now the mother in south africa has a court order against the party overseas so that was international maintenance law so when a client comes to me and tells me you know the father of the child or the mother of the child lives in a different country the first question i will pose to him or her is which country is it then i'll take out my look okay, i do it online i look at the government's website department of justice and you'll find out exactly which countries we have an agreement with and once I have done that, I can confirm whether or not South Africa has an agreement with a country. And if there is an agreement, we follow the Remo Act. If there is no such agreement, then we have to look at other specific creative ways of trying to obtain the maintenance for the other for the party living in South Africa. One way could be, for example, if there is no agreement, uh, to send a letter to the other party, contact the other party, because parents generally want would want to pay child maintenance. Um, but if they do not want to pay, then it becomes complicated because then you have to look at that specific country. Alternatively, the client here might have to institute proceedings in that specific country. So it can become a bit complicated. Each country uh, deals with different um, scenarios. It's like asking somebody um, different religions. Each religion is different. So how do you deal with today's Christianity, tomorrow is Judaism, tomorrow is Islam, Hinduism, and so on. So the same with the country, they all got their own laws and practices. There's a few questions that came in. Thank you for that. Let's deal with that. Oh, the commenter said earlier on, thank you. You are welcome. And she says, makes sense what you say. Thank you. You are welcome. And if you have any additional questions or comments, you are question number one. You're welcome to pose it. Just mention I'm question number one. And I'll copy and paste it into, onto the screen. So question, uh, is that either word? Number two says the following. Morning Advocate, my matter was this morning and I raised the issue about 50-50 ratio when one party is unemployed. I referred to what you said yesterday. Maintenance officer at Athlone said that this is, this is law and became very aggressive and said I must bring legal representation to challenge her because this is how the courts do it. Would you advise that I get legal representation? She said legal aid is only available if the other party takes legal aid too. Now, that is my opinion on the matter. Um, the question that was posed yesterday in a live Zoom, uh, live Zoom sorry, a live webinar. Let me see if there are any additional questions from this specific person. Let me first put that down before I give my comment. Ah, yes, there are two of them, so we can have a full picture before I start answering. And there's another comment from the same questioner. So this will be question number two. Yes deal with that now. I think we got it all. 
Then the comment goes further. I don't expect Father to cover all expenses. All I want was for him to be liable for 100% for the school fees, as it's a school he chose, and then I was happy to go half with everything else because I'm already covering more than half. Grandparents are assisting fully. Maintenance officer, that MO, said this cannot be. Everything must be 50 50. The matter was set down for trial now. I think I'm glad to hear the matter set down for trial. The maintenance officer does not make any decisions. It's an officer, it's a clerk. Sometimes they are legally trained, sometimes they are not. They're not attorneys, they're not lawyers, they never studied at university. Some of them could have. I do know from some course of people, uh, maintenance officers have studied, and sometimes they do not. I think in terms of the law, they should have a degree. I do not know. But nonetheless, they are maintenance officers and they're not magistrates. They do not make decisions. They can assist the parties in resolving the issues, but they cannot make a final decision. Seeing this matter is now postponed for trial, which I am happy to hear, um, the, ma the magistrate will have to apply the law, full stop. And the law does not say 50-50 if a party is unemployed. The law says according to your means. So, referring to your question, I would advise you, maybe under these circumstances, to obtain legal representation uh, to fight your case for you. I think the easy part of your case would most probably be the presentation of the evidence. Um, how much a child cost, what your expenditures are, and so on. I think the challenge might be at the end of the court case to convince the court on the law that proportionately we have confirmed exactly how much a child costs. child costs 100 rand. We worked out how much you earn. You earn zero, but your parents or grandparents are assisting you. The grandparents or the child are assisting you, and they're paying so much. So they're contributing. The father earns so much, and he should contribute so much. They can all be worked out, it can all be argued, you can argue it, but the arguments will be based upon, will all be determined based upon the principle that you pay maintenance according to your means. How you convince the court otherwise, how you tune the court, it's, it's like this. The principle is a father should pay and a mother should pay. That's the underlining principle. Once we're on the same page, then we can try to convince a magistrate to go here or there where there is a bit of doubt, maybe convince a court for, but to go here or go, to, to go there. But they needs to, the court needs to follow the legal principles regarding child maintenance, and that is according, paying according to your means. I hope that specifically answers your question. And do not want to worry about the maintenance officer. He is not, or she is not a magistrate, not an attorney, not an advocate. It's an officer. With respect to them, they do very important work. But... He cannot advise on the law, and especially if he's incorrectly advising on the law. The magistrate should deal with the matter, and they are legally trained people. I hope I answered the question. If there's any additional comments on that question, please um, leave a comment on the Advocate Muhammad Abdul Facebook page and you were commenter number two. I have an additional question for commenter number three, and let's put it down here. I'll make sure everyone can see what I can see. Okay, let's move on. The question is as follows. What happens when the father refuses to settle a round table with both having attorneys? So the parties cannot come to an agreement. The, the, the nature of a round table is it's a round table in principle. They don't necessarily have to use a round table, a circular table. But a round table basically means that nobody is at the head of the table. So, uh, generally, in a, in a work meeting, in a work conference, the main guy, the chairperson, he sits at the top of the table, and all the other parties around him are, you know, but subordinate in running the show. Here we have a round table, which basically means no one's run the show, we, the parties are trying to come to an agreement. So, regarding the specific comment, what happens if the father refuses to settle at the round table and both having attorneys? Um, it's difficult to, to, on the comment alone, you cannot expect someone to settle at the round table because he might, he wants to settle, but, on, what, but then you need to back down a bit. Or you willing to settle, but the other party has to back down a bit. So if you say settle, does it mean settling on your terms? Or is he not willing to come to the table at all, to the round table? But let's go on. 
Casey is always postponing court for maintenance. There is a joint asset of which he is paying the bond of this and saying this is the contribution towards the kids maintenance. So the father is paying the bond and this is now accommodation I presume where the mother stays in with the minor children and he's saying that this is his maintenance. So that's his argument. However, mother wants this asset to be sold and offer name which will see split equally. He is now running up expenses and he's on his end so if and when assets is sold so I presume when the assets get sold then the money whatever the proceeds that are paid out to him he'll use it to pay the debt court will say he cannot afford the same amount as he was paying on the bond I, I would in a, in a matter like this what I would do is first deal with the problem at hand the problem we have here is this house if parties are separated or they divorced this is my advice to everyone and not only to you, to clients. There needs to be a clean split. You do not have to deal, I do not advise you to deal with your ex-partner or your ex-spouse post the divorce or post the separation if there is an asset like a home or property involved whereby you have to, there's still a connection. Yes, for some people it, it works fine. They have an amicable separation. They see this property as an investment. But clearly here's a bit of acrimony and some, some issues over here. So the sooner this house can be sold, the better. And the law cannot force anyone to, to continue being a co-owner with another party if you do not want to be a co-owner. Therefore, the house will have to be sold as soon as possible. Proceeds split and then we can look at the matter properly. However, until then, until then, the facts have to be looked at as, as it is. If the father is wasting his money and running up unnecessary expenditure, the court will have to receive notice of You need to inform the court about that. Ultimately, the court will have to make a decision. My problem with all these negotiations and all these roundtable meetings, the only people that make money off this whole deal is are the lawyers who benefit from it, not necessarily the parties. Matters need to be resolved. You must say, stop with these roundtable meetings, give me a court date, let us run the show in a court date. Let us deal with this matter before you magistrate. Whereby you put forth your case, the income, your expenditure, um, and so on. The father will do the same, his, his, his debt which is incurring. And the, you need to argue the end of the case, tell the court, we should not consider the father's debt. He is incurring that debt specifically because he's trying to limit his maintenance payments or whatever the case may be. So you need to do that. So my advice to you is, first, please have that property sold and have this maintenance matter finalized. This roundtables must come to an end. Okay, if there's any additional comments, please um, pose it. You were question number three. I have a, yeah, additional comment. Thank you so much. Appreciate the guidance. You have really helped many of us. You are welcome, and I hope to help many of you in the future as well. Keep posting, and we will... You know, be able to help more people. Okay, so I see commenter number three had an additional comment. But before I deal with that, let me first copy commenter number four. This question. And I'll, before I lose this thread, it's a bit complicated after a while. So commenter number three has two additional comments. Let us copy that in. The first comment, and let's, let us deal with the second comment. Sorry, the third comment now. So, the two additional comments regarding this father that does, does not want to settle the matter and running up debt and his co ownership of the property. He's not willing to negotiate nor provide his requirements or even put forward a settlement proposal. Okay, he refuses to agree to signing the mandate for sale of the home and use it, it as leverage in his favor to avoid getting maintenance order. I do not see here because both parties have lawyers and the lawyers are supposed to do their jobs. So he is not willing to negotiate nor provide his requirements or even put forward a settlement agreement. That is fine, he has a right to do that. I'm certain if a settlement proposal could be, for example, that you get no money from the house. At all, I'm certain you will not agree to that, but that is fine. If the parties are not willing to come to an agreement, let the court make finalize this matter. That is just my view on, on these type of things. You want A, he wants A. You can't, can't come to an agreement. You're not willing to budge, you're not willing to give him A, he's not willing to step away and take B. Nobody wants B. 
The settlement cannot be finalized and lawyers need to finalize these issues. He refuses to agree to signing a mandate for sale of the house. That is fine. The court can force him to sign the mandate. It happens all the time. I'm in and out of the high court dealing with this type of application where one party who is co-owner of a property does not want to sign anything, does not want to get involved. The court gets involved, the court forces a sale, forces your hand. If you do not want to sign within seven days, the sheriff of the high court will sign that. The same applies with putting the house on the market, um, getting getting valuation on the property and so on. The court will do that. My, my problem with the scenario is here, there is clearly issues between the specific commenter and the other party. And I'm not judging anybody. I mean, this happens to thousands of couples, my friends, you know, my family, this standard. But these are problems that happen in reality. It cannot be resolved on the round table on the settlement of this matter. Therefore, we have courts. And courts, you know, they, they take the fist and then they iron matters out for you. Therefore, I advise you, these round tables don't work. I can see it clearly over here. Follow the law regarding the property, make a court application. If he opposes that application, he'll have to pay the legal cost for that. So I doubt he'll oppose that application. You're a co-owner, so there's no basis for that. On the maintenance matter, have it finalized as soon as possible. Okay, I hope that answers that. That was question number three. Here we have question number four. Thank you for waiting. I'm still busy with my honors and supporting my daughter full time. Every now and then, my mom has to help me support my daughter with milk and nappies, etc. The dad says my mother's income should be stated as part of the ratio. Is this correct? No, your mother's income should not be stated as part of the ratio unless a court orders your mother to pay. Um, then, of course, it, 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 it factors in. But your mother's income should not. Your mother has no legal obligation at present to maintain the minor child. The, the obligation lies on both parents. Yes, it's possible that the mothers can be ordered and they're welcome to, the grandparents can be ordered and they're welcome to pay. But the maintenance application, the ratios needs, needs to be based upon your income. Your mother is assisting you. So you can stipulate that I'm getting assistance from my mother, but that is not where it should go to. You can have extremely wealthy parents, super wealthy, but, your, but the obligation for, sorry, the amount of maintenance that gets paid to the minor child is based upon the parent's income, not the, gra the grandparents' wealth. You don't work maintenance at, at, on that basis. In tomorrow you, you work out maintenance based upon your brother, your sister, and so on. Maintenance is worked out based upon the parent's income and expenditure. If they do not have adequate income and expenditure, so income, then of course the court can look at the grandparents. They can step in to assist. But the mother's income has nothing to do with if the mother gives you a donation, she helps you out with something, that is fine. You can mention to the maintenance court that I get assistance from my parents, but they should not necessarily assist. It is the father and the mother's income that must be worked out. If at the end of the day, all that the father can afford is a hundred rand, but the child requires three hundred rand, and you can only afford also a hundred rand, then of course it makes sense to say, no, my mother will assist me. Alternatively, the court can order the grandparents to pay if the parents really can't afford to pay the minor child's reasonable expenditure. So the father is being unreasonable over here. I do not know what business the grandparents has in this equation. Then his parents must do exactly the same. If that is how it works, but it does, it does not work that way. I hope I'll answer that. Your question number four. If you have any additional comments, just comment and say four and I'll copy it in. I have an additional question. Okay, we're doing good timing. Number five. Oops. Let's get it higher up. It goes as follows, my ex-husband filed for him to not maintain due to being fired at work. So he must probably made an application for um, setting aside the maintenance order for losing a job. The maintenance officer refused to accept his excuse to pay maintenance, stating that he didn't provide enough documentation, bank statements and dismissal letter from work. That's fair. That's, that's the way I like it to be. He only showed an email and maintenance officer said she will not accept it as it was not stated that he was being dismissed. 
what is my next step and he is not paying anything since October you do not you should not be burdened with this because a maintenance order dismissed or not dismissed she never entertained his application therefore the current maintenance order still stands there's nothing for you to do your next step would be to lay a complaint at the maintenance court for non-compliance with the maintenance order a criminal complaint and, and he will be subpoenaed to the criminal courts they won't won't arrest him he will be subpoenaed to the criminal courts and he will have to explain to the courts why he's not paying maintenance being fired and losing your job does not mean you should not pay maintenance you you could have savings you could have policies you could have pension funds that must be paid out and so on you could have, have assets you can have a car you can sell the car the child must eat i mean i can afford the driver's car nicely do we ever and the child doesn't have food to eat you know that should be ashamed of yourself for that at the same time if a child has food to eat and he has clothing and he's fine you can have the most beautiful car the most expensive car i have no issue with that you know you can enjoy your life that is your right to do but if you have assets and you enjoy your life and the child does not have food to eat and clothing to wear and so on then i i definitely do not agree with that that is a big problem in my books so i hope you answered your question the order still stands he's running up the arrears if there's a pension fund it must be attached if he really lost his job Money can be taken, his property can be sold, he must still pay the maintenance order, lay the criminal, criminal complaint, but maybe the best thing to do would be to go to the maintenance court and say he's never paid since October, it's about three, four months from now, but it passed, and let him do the thing. They'll advise you what's best, either the civil route or the criminal route. I hope that answered my question. Sorry, I hope that answered your question, question number five. There's another question, question number six. The previous commenter said, thank you, you are welcome, you're all welcome, you're welcome to pose any additional questions. Let's go, this is a nice long one. If you do not feel like partaking this webinar, but you are watching it, please put in the comments where you're from. Either you're from Cape Town, Johannesburg, KwaZulu Natal, Mapumalanga, all those specific places. Uh, please comment on that it will be appreciated it's nice to know who's watching this videos and from where they're watching it from okay question number six thank you for that question let's get to it as soon as possible hi advocate what can a parent do when faces with a protection order the protection order is only sought to exert control over the non-custodian parent to legally refuse a non-custodial parent access to the child or children's access to the parent. So basically here, yeah, the one parent has primary care over the child, custody over the child, and she or he applies for protection order against the other parent in order for the and limit in order to limit the other parent's access to the child. It happens, it happens a lot. The protection order does not make any mention of the minor children, which is good. There is no parenting plan. The applicant confirmed to the police officer that there was no abuse. The applicant of the protection order does know that the defendant has a signed affidavit from the police officer that, that confirms no abuse took place. Can the protection order be used to prevent children from seeing the non consulting parent? No, it shouldn't be used. It cannot be used. It seems to me that this, this, this parties were not married. Um, they have no pending plan in place, they just have some type of understanding regarding contact. The one party applied to the domestic violence court for a protection order. It does not deal with the children. It must probably see no emotional, psychological abuse. I don't I do not know. I'm just guessing it's not important for the specific question. But the answer to this question is no, a protection order cannot be used. If there is a protection order in place. If, a, if there is a protection order in place, it's between the two parents, meaning the parents should not commit any domestic violence against each other, or one not against the other one. If the protection order says that the one parent cannot enter into the other party's home, with other normal clauses like not to commit any domestic violence, emotional, psychological, physical, and so on, cannot visit the person's work, that is fine. So we, we, we stick to that. Then we just have to find out a mechanism of of how contact can be exercised for argument's sake maybe contact should happen from the minor child's school where the one party picks the child up from school 
and drop the child up back at school the following Monday, where the other party would pick the child up or the children up from school the later in the day. So there is no need for that in a communication. Alternatively, all communication should only take place via email, in a civil manner. If there is any, you know, abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, that is a violation of the protection order, and the person can be arrested because of that. So you you have to be creative. And you'll have to work out ways and mechanisms to make it work. So a protection order is here to protect the parent. I think it's, I know it's really important to have it because many parties are living in an abusive relationship, etc. And sometimes people take advantage of it as well. I'm not commenting at all on the specific um, questioner. However, the protection order should not influence the type of contact a child has with a parent. Because how, how can this work? You know, the child has a right to be with a parent, to have contact with a parent. But mom and dad have issues. Why well, does it affect the child? You know, because the child is alone with dad or alone with mom. So you, I think you follow where I'm going to. But I do advise the specific um, commenter to try and agree upon a parenting plan. See a social worker, see a psychologist, agree upon a parenting plan, have it registered, made, made or made an order of court, or go to the children's court and let them assist you. But you need to finalize um, these specific issues. I hope that answers question number six. What's happening on the chat? I gotta thank you. You are welcome, and I gotta thank you. You are welcome too. And does not know. Sorry, the last comment just says that. Okay, yeah, no, I, I think I got it right over there. I hope I answered all those specific questions. I I do not see any additional questions coming in. I think we can call it a day, a week. Another comment, thank you very much. Advocate, you are welcome. Thank you for that. We are heading to 38 minutes of me tapping, typing a record on this video. It is being live. What I do later on, I upload onto YouTube for other people to watch it as well. It will always be on Facebook, so that's fine. Uh, those are the comments you can see on my right-hand side. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your questions, all six questioners. Um, I'll be back online on Monday morning. I cannot say what time. It's difficult to say. It's difficult to speak about the next week, <laughs> the previous week. But um, I'll be on. I'll be back online. And please um, follow the Advocate Mohammed Abdullah Facebook page. Like that page. I do deal with those questions. It is um, anonymous. I doubt you can see on the right hand side of your name at all. And when I place it on this bigger screen on the whiteboard, um, you can't see anything. Then you can see it. You can't see your name. Have a lovely weekend and I'll see you Monday. Thank you very much.